56, verses 8 through 11. I'll read it one more time. Isaiah 46, starting at verse 8. God's word for us this morning. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass I have purposed, and I will do it. After the sermon, we hope to respond by singing from hymn 35, Nothing Shall Separate Us from the Love of God, hymn 35, after the sermon. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, the doctrine of God's providence can be simply summarized as the teaching that God is in full control over everything. Everything that happens in this life, everything that happens in this world, God in His providence is in full control. We, we confess that in Lord's Day 10 of the Catechism. It's His almighty and ever-present power, whereby everything happens not by chance but by his fatherly hand, it means he's in total control. Nothing happens outside of his control. But that teaching, that doctrine, can at times be pretty difficult to hear, let alone believe. Even if you would go back into Isaiah's day, and think about life for the people that he's speaking to. Uh, Isaiah lived around the time right before the Israelites went into exile, the kingdom of Judah went into exile. In fact, while he speaks often, uh, the Assyrian Empire is coming at them, and they defeat the northern kingdom of Israel and send them off into exile. And he's speaking to the people of Judah near Jerusalem. They're not in exile yet, but he's saying, uh, you're not going to get put into exile now, but it is coming, and it's, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be one of the most devastating and, and tragic experiences that the nation of Israel will ever experience. And then you can imagine Israel going through that. They've heard even the prophecy that we're reading uh, this morning about God being in total control, and then they go through some of these difficult times. Imagine it for a moment, uh, having an army come in and tear down your house or light it on fire, drag you off uh, mercilessly to go live in another land. And that's if they let you live at all. And it's not like you're going to be in that land with your family and with all your things. All of your things are gone. They often separated family members so that you would lose your identity, lose your connection. You'd be off on your own. All that you know, all that you love, erased. And then they're thinking of this prophecy. God in control of all things. I'm going to bring these things to pass. I will do it. If God's in control? Really? Of this? Of all this pain, all this suffering that I'm experiencing? He let this happen? It's the same cry we hear in our own lives today in times of difficulty, in times of tragedy. It's the same cry that can't be held in by the the grieving mother who loses a child in the womb or the young parent who's overwhelmed with the misery of of losing their, their spouse at a young age with a family still to raise. It's the cry of those picking up the pieces after a natural disaster like a flood comes in and destroys hundreds of houses, killing thousands. We saw it not that long ago on the world stage or an earthquake topple a city That happened recently as well in Morocco. It's a cry heard regularly around the world. If there is a God over this world, and if he is in control of it, why is this world so painful? 
Why would he crush us so often and cause us so much pain? Makes you realize that the doctrine of providence, it gets at the very epicenter of our battle in the faith. After all, for believers, it's this teaching, this doctrine of providence, God being in control, it's supposed to make us thankful in good times. That's what, that's what the catechism says in Lord's Day 10. We can be thankful in prosperity. And, and then also in the difficult times, it, it's supposed to make us patient. Patient in adversity. It's supposed to help. It's supposed to comfort. And even if you go into the New Testament and you look at the Apostle Paul, how often he speaks about God's majesty and his, his control over all things uh, in places like Ephesians 1 and Romans 8 and, and Romans 11. He, he's rejoiced and he breaks out in praise afterwards about God's providence. That's what our heart is supposed to do when we hear that doctrine. And yet, somehow, it can have very different reactions in our lives when we hear it depending on what we're going through, uh, and different reactions in this world, too. So we hope to look, then, more closely at this teaching about God's providence as he declares it in Isaiah 46. Uh, it's one of the clearest texts on just how powerful God's control is, and it challenges us, actually, to see God's providence from the right perspective, from a perspective that starts in faith. And it does that by calling us, as our theme is this morning, to reflect on God's good providence. And we're going to break it down by those three words. As you can see, the word reflect, the word God's, and the word good. Reflect on God's good promises, God's good providence. And we'll first look at the word reflect. Why reflect? Well, we see it at the very beginning of our text, verse 8. There's three words going into verse 9 that emphasize this. Remember, recall, and then remember again. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. And if all that follows describes God's control over all things, Him being different than anybody else, there is no other. He knows all things that are going to happen and He makes them happen. Uh, then what's being told here to remember and to recall is God's providence. Being, we're being told to remember it. And it's not just a, a, a memory exercise for the sake of, of checking to see if we, we have a good memory. Okay, you, you've, you've checked and yes, you remember. No, the word remember means to, to really reflect on it, to chew on it, to ponder it. Think long and hard about how God has been and is in control of all things. And when you do that, when you reflect on it, when you steep yourself in it, marinate in it, that leads to the right perspective, the right way of looking at this teaching. That's what's the important part that God has for, for taking his people from a situation where they would be tempted to cry out, why, how, how could you be in control, God, and let all these things happen and start bringing them back towards a place of, yes, you are in control, and I trust it. I'm at peace with it. And notice a couple of things then from these introductory verses about this call to remembrance, uh, this call to reflect. First of all, it's, it's not just a, a very specific reflection. It's, it's a big picture reflection. Uh, verse 9 says, remember the former things of old. And the, the word therefore of old uh, is actually the same word that's the first word in the Hebrew Bible, which we often translate as in the beginning, in the, the time of old. So really, you're looking at verse 9, and it's saying, remember the former things back in the beginning. It's pointing back, it's zooming all the way back to the start of creation, and remembering where everything has come from. And so when you start there, then you can see where everything came from and where it is all going. And the Israelites then, if they're called to reflect on the, the things from the beginning, they're called to reflect on the history of the world and their story in it. How their, their pain and suffering 
in the, is actually part of a bigger picture of how God created this world as, as a good world back with Adam and Eve, how us as human beings fell into sin and how God graciously out of that still chose a special people through Abraham to be the, the father of that nation Israel, even though Israel was nothing special in themselves. And as they continue to reflect, they look back over that whole course of time and they see them as the people of God, not being a very good people of God, rebelling constantly, not trusting in Him, going through that wilderness the way they did, constantly complaining, constantly bickering. Uh, When they get their nation, when they get their king, they're still turning away from Him constantly, rebelling against God's plan, God's way for them. And when they reflect on this bigger picture, this whole story, it doesn't necessarily take the pain away that they're in as they lose their family, lose their homes, lose everything, and get sent to a foreign land. It doesn't take that pain away. But they also realize that that pain is not the whole story. The whole story is is much bigger than that pain in that time. And that's true for us too. The pain you're experiencing in your life is not the the whole of your life. Never mind, it's not the whole of the, the big overarching plan that God has for this world that he's been working on. So this reflection is a, is a big picture thing, bigger than our own pain in the specific circumstances, bigger than our own lives. It's the history of this world. That's the first thing. The second thing from these introductory verses is tied in with that because when you look at the bigger picture, you realize you're a sinner. And that comes out in verse 8. It says, recall it to mind, you transgressors, you sinners. And if you're following along as we were going through the whole chapter, you might notice that God, through his prophet Isaiah, he he doesn't sound all that cheerful in this chapter. Uh, If you read verse 12, you, you hear it again. God says, listen to me, you stubborn of heart, you who are far from righteousness. You're not even close to righteousness. God is not happy with his people, which maybe at first you don't actually realize because he says some nice things about his care for them in verses 3 and 4. You've been born by me. I've been carrying you from birth, uh, carried you from the womb, uh, even to your old age. I am he. To gray hairs I will carry you. I've been carrying you your whole life through. It sounds really nice. God says he will save in that verse as well, verse 4. But when you read it in light of the whole chapter, you start to realize that God is actually almost exasperated when he says those words. It's like, I'm I'm always carrying you. I've I've been bearing you for ages. I've been doing all the work. I'm the one that that has had to to take you from birth right to death, to gray hairs. So remember this, you sinners. It all has that aspect of of us not, not... pleasing God, but instead making him angry. So when we're called to reflect, and we're told we're transgressors, God's reminding us of our place in his overall story, and that place is one of of undeserved grace. God, having done so much for us, uh, he's given us life itself. He's given us breath and everything else with it. Uh, All of our lives... The fact that we exist is a gift from Him. And there are so many things in our lives that we don't realize how good we have it. Things that God is doing right in front of us and things that God is doing behind the scenes that we don't even realize. And despite all of the things that He's constantly doing for us that we know and don't know, we still find ourselves not caring, outright rebelling against Him, being stubborn of heart, taking His laws and doing our own thing anyways. If we are honest with ourselves, the more we read through what the Israelites did in their history, what people all over the world have been doing in history, the things they do are exactly the things we do in our own heart. We're rebellious as well. God calls us transgressors as well. You think of the Israelites in the wilderness. Well, who of us always trusts 
that God is actually going to provide for us everything that we need. There's so many times that we fail to trust that ourselves. That's what the Israelites were doing. Who of us doesn't put our own feelings and desires first sometimes in our lives? That's really what was at the heart of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah turning so rebelliously against God. Who of us doesn't get jealous at the success of others and we want that success for ourselves? Like Cain, who went and murdered Abel. Or go right back to Adam and Eve. Who of us doesn't want some glory for ourselves, some power, and, and we wonder, and we, we wonder if we can really trust that God's way is the best way, and we, we, we want to just, you know, take time to do things our way for a bit. We all have the same sins that are so clear and obvious in the scriptures, but they're in our lives as well. And we do all these things in one degree or another, not loving God, not loving neighbor, and by not doing that, breaking this world, uh, causing others all kinds of pain, loneliness, hurt, all the suffering that goes on in this world, when we think about it, it, it's here because of the everyday sins that we all commit against each other, not building each other up uh, the way that we should, not loving each other, not putting ourselves uh, away and, and, and putting others first in our lives. We just break things down to different degrees in different places. But it all deserves punishment. Uh, All that pain, all that suffering, God doesn't like it, but it's we're the ones that are putting it in this world. We broke this world. We put it under a curse. It all deserves to be wiped away. It all deserves to be washed clean and, and start completely over. But God was not done with this world, and God was not done with, with us either. God loved even his enemies. He continued to provide for all, care for all, including all of us who don't deserve it. He makes his sun rise on the evil, says Matthew 5, and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. He continues to provide. So when we reflect then on us being transgressors who only receive times of joy and opportunities for any happiness as gifts of of undeserved grace, things that we, we definitely haven't earned for ourselves. When we reflect in that way, our hearts come at the doctrine of providence at, from a more, a more humble, but really more accurate angle. It's an angle that when you, you think of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who 100% believed in the doctrine of God's providence, of his Father's control over all things, of his Father's will being the right will, you think about Jesus Christ knowing that providence, and yet he still, he cried out, didn't he? Uh, At the Garden of Gethsemane, he suffered deeply. He had concern of what was going to happen with his Father's plan for his life. And yet, he couldn't share our perspective in the sense that he wasn't a transgressor. He wasn't a sinner. He had done everything perfectly. He had uh, just rightly obeyed his Father in everything. And he wasn't limited in his perspective. He saw the whole plan. He knew exactly what the Father was doing and what it was going to accomplish. He could tell it was going to hurt. He could tell that he was going to take the worst pain for us. It caused him to say to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, my soul is sorrowful even to death. He asked for the cup to to pass from him. He cried out in anguish of soul on the cross. And he did that despite not deserving it. Despite knowing his doctrine of providence. All so that you and I could take time to reflect on the whole picture of our lives. And, and when we reflect on it, even as transgressors, as sinners, we're allowed to reflect on it now and not dread. Not dread what's coming. Something worse is not coming. The worst thing has already come. And it landed on our Savior on the cross. That is our great Savior. And how He looks at God's providence. And how He transforms God's providence for our good. And 
we look then next, as we look at that, as we reflect on in the big picture of things, we, now we start looking at the, the God who claims to have this kind of power. Who is to say that this God actually has the power to do this? That this God's plan will actually be completed? Why well, reflect on God's good providence? Let's look at that in our second point. The question is answered really in the second half of verse 9. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Those are phrases that are repeated several times, actually. If you would read through Isaiah 40 through 66, those words would come up more than once. Uh, it's the whole section of Isaiah points repeatedly to the fact that God is different than anyone else in this world, any other God that any other culture might worship, any other religion might revere. This God, the Lord, the God of Israel, He is different. There is none like Him. And there's proof of that even just in our, our own chapter here, Isaiah 46. You look at verse 1. It says, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Those are two Babylonian gods. Babylon was the one that was going to bring Israel into exile and crush them. And God is saying already before they do that, that those gods are, are really pathetic. They don't do anything. Their idols are put on beasts and those beasts can barely carry them. And, and those idols end up going down into captivity with those beasts. When Babylon is going to be defeated, those gods are going to be defeated. It goes on as well in, in verses 5 through 7 to describe all idols, how really useless they are. Uh, verse 7 sums up the problem with them uh, near the end. You, you set the idol in its place, it can't move, it just stands there. If one cries to it, it doesn't answer or save him from his trouble. If you want more colorful language of how useless idols are, you can turn to Isaiah 44 and start at verse 9. Uh, the folly of idolatry. There's tons of descriptions there of, of just how pathetic it is that we would serve some, some sort of object that we can make ourselves. But, but really, the, the contrast between God and idols is, is quite simple. God, God acts. God actually does. God says things are going to happen, and they happen. You ask him things and he, he answers. Really, what verse 10 ends up saying about God sums it up. God declares from the beginning, from creation, the end, the things that are going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And then it happens. He declares from ancient times the things not yet done. He says, my counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. This is basically where God defines what his providence is. God, God claims all kinds of power over everything that happens in this world. And he explains here just how far that power goes. You can sum it up with, with really two words here. Uh, that it's all-encompassing and that it's invincible. All-encompassing and invincible. By, by all-encompassing, I mean there's, everything is under that power. There's nothing that's not under that power. That's kind of what's implied by the fact that he starts from the beginning, from ancient times, and he can say everything that's going to happen, all of time, it's all known by him, controlled by him. Again, that, that language is similar to, to creation. He, and he's able to say that every little thing that's going to happen, it's part as well of that word all in verse 10. I will accomplish all my purpose. There's nothing that's going to be outside of that. And Jesus himself took that teaching and explained it in his own beautiful language when he said uh, at one point that not a hair can fall from our head apart from the Father's will. And theologians, as they describe uh, God's providence over the, the ages, have worked out the implications of this truth in colorful ways in their teaching as well. Charles Spurgeon once said in a sermon, I believe that, that every particle of dust 
that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. Or theologian R.C. Sproul, when he said there, there are no maverick molecules in all of the universe. Nothing's getting away. Nothing's getting outside of God's control. And since we're called to reflect on that, brothers and sisters, reflect on just how all-encompassing this is. It means God is in control of, of every little part of creation, every single creature in creation, every little decision that that creature makes from the ant turning right or left in their tunnel to the, the wanderings of, of the, the greatest sea creature in the ocean. It means as well as he has providence over every spiritual being, over the angels he created, even over the fallen angels that we now call demons, even over Satan himself. The book of Job makes that clear. Satan had to answer to the Lord. No temptation was allowed to go outside of the Father's will. It means God has control over history, over nations, over leaders. That's actually mentioned specifically here in verse 11. That's the context for all of this in Isaiah 46. Isaiah 45 talked about how God was bringing about this Cyrus, whom he was anointing to deliver Israel out of exile. It's a Persian king. Cyrus comes from the east. That's why verse 11 is referring to him. God is, is going to accomplish his purpose, he says, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. He's going to deliver Israel. I'm in control over that leader. It was all under God's control. And it's not just good leaders, even evil leaders. Their worst plans are all under his control. And that's always, ultimately, for a reason. Think of Nebuchadnezzar. He's the one that destroyed so much of, of the Israelites and, and hurt them so much. Uh, think of the evil Assyrian empire that came, out, came to Israel before that. They were tortuous, brutal in history in terms of how they treated people. And yet God was using them. God was in control. His all-encompassing power is over every nation and every leader. That means also today in everything that's going on. You read of all the different uh, arguments and disagreements and wars and rumors of wars. Uh, we can get overwhelmed even trying to keep up with all the different crises in all the different countries of the world God has it all in his hands, as only he can. All-encompassing means providence over life and death, over the moment you were born to the moment of your last breath. He knows it all. He guides it all. Through times of health, through struggles with sickness, nothing gets away from him. Nothing gets lost or, oops, that, that, that slipped on my mind. It means God has providence over even your spiritual life, your spiritual health. If you were born into a Christian family, that didn't happen by chance. God guided that. If you converted at an older age, that wasn't something you chose to do outside of God's providence. No, God is the one who brought you to that point. It also means for you as a Christian that God has still control over the growth of your life, the, the progress of your spiritual life, over your struggles, over the times of doubt, the downs and the ups. It's not like he saves you and then says, well, I've done my part, let's see if they stay afloat, we'll, we'll watch what happens. Now, even in your temptations, even in your feeling far from the presence of God, he is still guiding things, still in control. We even go as far as to confess that God has providence, and we have to be careful in how we say that, but God has providence over the sin that is in this world. We're careful because we don't want to say that God is the author of sin. We're the ones responsible for it, and we'll get back to that a little bit later. But that doesn't mean that sin happens outside of his control, as if, oh, now these people rebelled, and now I don't know what to do anymore. You think of Genesis 50, verse 20, how the brothers of Joseph sinned, they outright sinned by putting Joseph in the pit. 
them selling them into slavery, but God all along was controlling that, making sure that that happened in order that Israel could be saved so that those men, those brothers, when they ran out of food in the time of the famine, would have somewhere to go. You can think of how God hardened Pharaoh's heart in order to work a mighty miracle to bring Israel out of Egypt. Or go right back to the beginning. God creating this world. Creating, we find out in the New Testament that he does that. Uh, He creates all things in Christ and for Christ and through Christ. He, He had the plan for Jesus Christ already from the beginning of the world. It means that when Jesus died on the cross, God's plan was still being carried out. That must mean then that God knew sin itself would come and he had a plan for it, even before he created the world. In fact, his plan was to conquer that sin with the sending of his son, the Messiah, in the fullness of time when everything had been orchestrated just right as he put it together. He sacrificed his own son for our sake to rescue us and bring about a greater future. And we have to confess too that that future too is under his control as well. The new heavens and the new earth, it will all be the perfect display of his plan. That's how all-encompassing his control is, his providence. But there was another word. I said all-encompassing and invincible Invincible means you can't conquer it, you can't overcome it. Verse 10 catches that as well in the second half. My counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. It's, it's just going to happen. Nothing is going to stop God from doing what he plans. He is unlike any other God that way. Nobody has any other control. It comes as being the one that created this world, the one that knows all about this world, the one that then can have the power over it, being different than this world. He's over us. You think of that quote from R.C. Sproul when he says, there's no maverick molecule. That that means that there's no molecule that can be like, I'm going to go against God's plan. I'm going to go rogue here and do something that God never thought I would be able to do. And when you think of that, It just shows, really, the pathetic attempt of Satan. Satan, who thought he could rebel. When, really, his whole rebellion was under God's control. And you see that the most clearly at the cross. You see Judas. Satan goes into Judas. Satan betrays Judas so that... uh, uh, Sorry, Judas betrays Jesus so that Jesus has to go to the cross. Uh, The whole time it plays right into the Father's plan so that when he goes to the cross, sin can be paid for. Salvation can be won. Satan tried, but God's providence was invincible. He couldn't conquer it. As verse 11 says too, I have spoken, I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, I will do it. That's his guarantee. Knowing then that God's providence is all encompassing and invincible, what about when we get into that tragic circumstance that we're going through? Is this still truly comforting? when we're feeling that pain, when we're feeling that loss, when we're lacking hope, when we're despairing, does this answer the skeptic when they see God actually using sin in this world, using Satan? Why would he do that? Doesn't that make God evil? If God is in control, why are we even bothering doing anything? He's just letting us experience pain for his own tortuous pleasure. It's almost sadistic, isn't it? That's why we turn to our third point, why we can say that it's God's good providence that we're called to reflect on.
I start with the text then more in terms of its context as proof that this is a good providence. Isaiah 46 is written as God having a plan on the other side of the exile. It was a plan not just to bring exile on his people, but a plan to bring deliverance. That was Cyrus coming in verse 11 as that bird of prey from the east to bring about salvation. And you can confirm that by what you read in verse 13. Uh, Verse 12, yes, it says, Listen to me, you stubborn of heart, you are far from righteousness. But God still, despite their sin, has a plan for good. Verse 13, I bring near my righteousness, it is not far off, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. God has something glorious in mind for his people. It's not going to be something that you're going to look at and go, oh, that's not good. It's going to be something when you see the whole plan that you are going to rejoice in and say, praise God. This is awesome. And it it happens like this really all over the scriptures. The negative that we have brought about by our own sin, being stubborn of heart and being far from righteousness, that God then transforms into salvation and into glory. It goes back actually to how Paul describes God's master plan in Ephesians 1, that big vision that he has of of how God looks at salvation from the beginning, from before the foundation of the world, how he chose us, we were going to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. He predestined us for that, he says in Ephesians 1 verse 5, in love. And you see why. Why? For what purpose? He did it according to the purpose of his will. And Ephesians 1 verse 6 says, To the praise of his glorious grace. That's what the result is going to be. We're going to be praising his glorious grace. That means that it's not going to be an an insincere praise. It's not like God is going to force us and say, Now you praise me because I did something good here. No, this is natural praise that comes out of a heart that sees the big picture when it's finally clear to us. We see his master plan and we rejoice because his master plan is saving unworthy sinners who don't deserve it through the suffering and death of his son, Jesus Christ. It's glorious grace. And it leads to praise. God promises that we will all be standing before his throne and before the Lamb in the book of Revelation and we will all, with honest and perfect hearts, be praising the grace of God that we see there on display in the Lamb who was slain. That means then, brothers and sisters, that we're not just, as people that believe in God's providence, we're not just people that are fatalistic, thinking whatever is, just is going to be. Whatever will be, will be. Spurgeon actually said it well uh, when he said the doctrine of providence is not what is must be, but that what is works together for the good of our race and especially for the good of the chosen people of God. There's a purpose for it, and it's a good and glorious purpose. And as well, that doesn't just leave us without responsibility. It's not like, well, God's in control and I don't have any responsibility. No, this is where it's the majesty and the, the different nature of God that makes such a difference. God has the capability of still being in control of all things while still working with people that he gives a will to. We're not just robots. John Piper says it well in his book on providence when he says, providence is all-embracing and all-pervasive, but when God turns the human will, there is a mystery to it that causes a person to experience God's turning as his own preference, an authentic, responsible act of the human will. And he concludes by saying, 
Yes, God is sovereign over our preferences, but we are accountable for our preferences as well. That's the way God is able to work because he's different than us. We trust that he has that kind of power if he has power over all things as he says he does. And one last, last author quoted by Piper actually in his book on providence, Clyde Kilby, put it this way. Even if I turn out to be wrong about all of this, even if I turn out to be wrong, I shall bet my life on the assumption that this world is not idiotic, not run by some absentee landlord, but instead that today, this very day, some stroke is being added to the cosmic canvas that in due course, I shall understand with joy as, as a stroke made by the architect who calls himself Alpha and Omega. I choose to trust that there's a, there's a greater canvas, he says, that there's a greater purpose, and that every stroke on it is going to be glorious because the architect of it is glorious. I bet my life on that. And that really gets at the heart, to go back to the beginning, of the difference of faith. Trusting in this God who claims this all-encompassing, invincible providence. There is suffering in this world. There's no doubt about that. Nobody argues that. But does it have a purpose? And the scriptures tell us that God has a glorious purpose for it. One that we will be rejoicing in. And faith then trusts that God's providence is good. And that is because that faith first and foremost looks to the cross of Jesus Christ. And it sees how far God is willing to go to make sure good happens for us. God doesn't just set this suffering world in motion and go, well, uh, let's let them suffer. I'm, I'm guiding it, but ha, they're suffering. No, he sees the suffering. He weeps over the suffering. And he goes so far as to send his own son, who is part of the triune God, a person of the Trinity, and his own son suffers in and because of this world so that good can come of it. If he's willing to do that for us undeserving sinners, how is he not also going to be willing to make sure all things throughout the course of history are going to work for the good of those who love him? Indeed, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of this great God. He is God. There is no other. Trust in him. Amen.